Are you guys excited? Yeah! Me too. So like Cameron said, I'm a research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab down the street, and I have been really privileged to work with some amazing teams exploring our cosmic backyard and trying to figure out if we are actually the only thing around or if there could be life somewhere else. And so one of the missions that I'm fortunate enough to work on is the Dragonfly mission. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. First, let's skip over to Saturn. What we have done takes spacecraft, oh, you know, seven-ish years to do. Space is big. Saturn is 10 times further away from the sun than Earth is. Now, that's important because that means that it receives, you know, one over the distance squared, it receives one hundredth as much sunlight as Earth does. And when you're trying to think about places in our solar system where life could exist, most of the life on Earth, either directly or indirectly, is dependent on sunlight. Um, some of these places, like Titan that I'll be talking about today, uh, may have less of an opportunity to develop life that could be based on that energy source. So that's one of the things that we're interested in exploring uh, about this uh, beautiful world and its moons. So Titan, this is actually two scale. This is one of the images that Cassini took. Titan is the largest moon in the solar system if you count its atmosphere. If you take its atmosphere away, then Ganymede is a little bit bigger, and that's fine. We'll give Ganymede a win because I think Titan is so fascinating. It doesn't need that you know, pesky little largest moon in the solar system prize. Yeah, Titan actually has a thick atmosphere, thicker than Earth's. It's about one and a half bar pressure as opposed to one bar like we have here on Earth. And because Titan's atmosphere is more dense and its gravity is a lot less, it's about the same as the astronauts when they hop around the moon. It's about one-sixth Earth's gravity. So that means if you were standing on the surface of Titan and you had wings and you flapped them, you could fly. And that'll be important later. Can't imagine why. Uh, but it does. It has this thick atmosphere that's actually uh, not, a, we can't see through it with visible wavelengths. Um, but there are some other wavelengths that we can use to peer through those thick, haze layers that are generated. We're all in LA right now. We know about smog. It's the same thing on Titan. Photochemistry, even this far away, can still lead to these complex organic molecules that are formed in Titan's dense atmosphere, form these haze layers, and eventually you know, fall down onto the surface. But we can peer through that thick haze layer in wavelengths that our eyes can't see, like infrared. And this is one of my favorite images of Titan that a, a colleague, Christophe Sotan, helped plan. He was like, OK, we're going to use the infrared. And what you are looking at is the glint of sunlight in the infrared off of a Titan lake at the North Pole. Because Titan has a lot of the same features that Earth does, but it's made out of different stuff. Now, Titan has clouds. On Earth, our clouds are mostly made of water vapor, but on Titan, these are made out of methane, ethane, hydrocarbons, things like hydrogen cyanide, which is, you know, not good for you. Don't breathe that in. Uh, as a chemist, we, we like to say they're old chemists, they're bold chemists. There are no old, bold chemists, because, you know, we don't like to huff cyanide or blow ourselves up. Uh, but yeah, so Titan is, has these complex kind of gnarly chemicals that will form clouds. It actually has a hydrologic cycle, but the hydro doesn't stand for water on Titan. It stands for hydrocarbons, mostly liquid methane and ethane. This actually forms rain, in some cases maybe a little bit of snow. It falls to the surface and carves these river channels, and it pools in those beautiful lakes that I mentioned before, primarily at the poles. Whenever I give talks to kids, I talk about liquid farts, because that's basically what this is. Uh, and they're quite large, actually. These lakes are you know, larger than the Great Lakes here in the States. And as a chemist and someone who's interested in astrobiology, this fascinates me. Think about like high school chemistry. Water is what kind of solvent? Polar or nonpolar? Polar. It's polar, right? Methane is the opposite. Methane is nonpolar. So remember, like dissolves like. Anything that dissolves in a liquid methane lake, by definition, is going to have to be very different from anything that would dissolve in liquid water. So a microbe swimming around in a Titan sea would have to be made out of different stuff. Now, it could still be made out of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, the, the building blocks that are there. But they would have to be constructed in different ways to be able to allow something to subsist in that kind of very different 
solve it. So it's kind of cool, right? It's like that, that planet in Star Trek where you have like the two completely different biospheres. Yeah, that, right in our cosmic backyard. Hey, you don't even need to go to sci-fi. It's real, which is kind of cool. And we, uh, we also see evidence that the surface is changing. These kinds of terrains uh, are formed when like some bits dissolve away. If you've been to say the Mojave Desert or the Mesquite Sand Dunes or places like that in Death Valley, uh, you can see places where gypsum is uh, dissolved or eroded away by, by rain, by wind, by processes like that. Similar things are happening on Titan. We also have dunes, but again, we think they're made out of different stuff on Titan. The dunes are probably not silica sands like we have here. They're most likely organic molecules, but that's the best we could tell from Cassini. Cassini was the first mission I ever got to work on and it observed Titan as well as Saturn and its rings and a lot of other moons, but it had difficulty peering through that dense haze layer. And so we know a lot about Titan, but there are still a lot of mysteries left to uncover. We know that it's got this, this dense haze layer, a thick atmosphere. We know that its, its crust is mostly water ice. It's probably got a veneer of organic -y stuff on top of that. That's what makes the dunes and a few other things. And deep down underneath all of that, Titan also has a liquid water ocean. So it's got two solvents, uh, one on the surface and one on the interior. And there could be opportunity for those to exchange through things like cryovolcanism. So this is a really fascinating dynamic world. Uh, we like to call it a prebiotic or maybe even a biotic chemical laboratory on a planetary scale. And boy, wouldn't it be nice to go there? Oh, we are! <laughs> Launching in 2028 now, assuming that NASA still exists then, uh, we will be cruising through the solar system and arriving at Titan on, in 2034. Instead of seven minutes of terror like we have going through Mars' thin atmosphere, we're going to have about 70 minutes of mild angst as we slowly <laughs> transcend through that dense atmosphere. And yeah, we talk about Titan as a helicopter, but really the most accurate way to describe this is a relocatable lander. And instead of, it's, it, this is the size of the big Mars rovers, you know, Curiosity, Perseverance, you know, the size of a car. That's how big this is. We just took the wheels off, we gave it skis, and then we gave it these, these counter-rotating um, sets of helicopter blades because it's more efficient to move through that dense atmosphere in these multi-kilometer hops than it would be to drive like a traditional rover. Now, in our two-year um, mission plans time for our prime mission, this gives us an opportunity to explore a lot of different what we call terrains because Titan isn't just one boring you know, place that looks the same everywhere, right? It's got dunes, it has some impact craters, it has basins, it has interdune regions. There are all these fascinating places that we want to explore with Dragonfly. And so being able to do these multi-kilometer hops get us, gets us to those new places faster. And we'll be doing all sorts of science and now, Dragonfly is not a flagship mission. That means it's not the same class. It's not as big as Cassini or Clipper or Perseverance in terms of its payload. Those tend to have you know, eight, maybe 10 instruments. This is one class below that called New Frontiers, uh, which means its budget is a little bit more constrained. And so we had to be more careful at what instruments we selected because um, we couldn't bring everything that we wanted to take. And I think that we've come up with a really nice complementary package of things that are going to revolutionize our understanding of Titan. So we have a geophysics and meteorology package uh, so we'll be able to give you a weather report on Titan, including percent relative humidity of methane, which I, I just think that's great. Uh, we're also going to be able to deploy a seismometer to detect Titan quakes, and that'll tell us a lot about the interior of Titan. We have a mass spectrometer, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, shortly here. This will... Is, essentially our way to be able to taste a lot of the molecules that are present in Titan's atmosphere and on the surface. And this is gonna be really important for some of those biosignature tests we want to do. To collect sample for that, we have something called Draco. A couple people here are from Honeybee. Yeah, thank you for that. They're building that for us. We like our acronyms, if you can tell. And uh, we're, of course, going to have a lot of cameras and imagers uh, because Titan is very far away. It's somewhere, depending on where Saturn and Earth are, like 
in our orbital dance around the sun, we're anywhere from 68 to 86 minutes away. So this rotor craft has to be able to fly completely independently, make its own decisions, do landing site assessment, all of that on its own. So that camera suite is really important for doing that. And then we also have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. This is something that will basically get us the bulk elemental composition just below the rotor craft. And that'll be important for understanding how the geology of Titan is changing as we, we do our flying hops. And so we've decided on a landing site for a few reasons. Uh, we picked this area called Selk Crater. Now, Titan's atmosphere is very dense. That means that most meteors that come in, they burn up before they ever get to crash into the surface. Uh, so Titan has very few craters, uh, but those that it does have, they're big, and that's nice. Craters tend to be nice and flat and safe. They're really good places when you want to land, you know, billions of miles away from where, you know, all the rest of us are sitting there, like, stress eating <laughs> for those 70 minutes of mild angst. It's going to be more than mild. <laughs> and we're not even going to know it landed safely until, you know, 68 or 86 minutes later. So that's fun. But, um, but yeah, so we're landing in this crater because we know it's nice and safe and flat. And this crater has done the work of excavating that veneer of organic material so we can get a look at what the bedrock of Titan is like. So we're like, cool, let's start there, and then we'll do some of these flying hops. And we've got a plan for how we do this. So each time Dragonfly takes off, it'll go scope out landing site number two, and then go back to landing site number one that it scoped out the first time, except for the very first time we take off, because obviously n plus one, you know, you need like two. Anyway, the point is we're going to start to do this so that we'll be able to have some ground in the loop, some scientists and engineers will be able to assess that next landing site to be sure that it meets our science criteria. Is it interesting? It's going to be interesting. And also, is it safe? And so being able to do this gives us a lot of opportunities to be able to check on things, um, but still make a lot of progress in a short amount of time. So this is what Draco is going to do. It's essentially a percussive drill and a fancy vacuum cleaner, because we can take advantage of that thick atmosphere. Uh, we'll be able to move material from Titan's surface up inside of Dragonfly, and then it's going to go into two different sample cups. One. You can see here, we're going to hit it with a UV laser. This is what we call a soft ionization technique. It's good for delicate molecules, things like fatty acids, maybe some proteins or things like that, so we can get an idea of what the complex organics are like. And then some sample cups will go basically into a little oven. They'll get heated up. This is something called pyrolysis, so you basically heat everything up, <coughs> turns into a gas, uh, and then you can separate it and look at what's there. And so between these two different techniques, both of those will be analyzed by the mass spectrometer and, and give us some idea of the kinds of organic molecules that are there, including some tests for potential biosignatures like that chirality that you just saw. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you guys have questions. But basically, it's one way to look for evidence of life. Now, we can also do work here in the lab to try to prepare for the kinds of molecules we expect to find and what kind of concentrations. And so I've worked with a couple of really great students to be able to constrain in that subsurface liquid water ocean. You forget about that? The one that's down, it's, it's still, it's there too? Yeah. Uh, microbes could, could be existing in that ocean. They could uh, generate methane through eating hydrogen. That's one common way that uh, we, we tend to model these sort of ocean worlds, the kinds of organisms that could live there. But Titan has a whole bunch of other interesting organic molecules, including acetylene, which is you use it for you know acetylene torches for welding. It's a really energetic molecule. It's two carbons with a triple bond in between. That's a lot of energy. And microbes, there are certain kinds that can eat that. And so uh, my a student, Maya Yanez, did some work for her PhD uh, where she found that actually that energy source would produce even more life than if they were just, you know, eating hydrogen and pooping out methane. So that's kind of cool. But the point is, we can't be Earth-centric when we are thinking about the kinds of life, what they might eat, where they might be, um, and how they might behave. So we've tried really hard to design tests to be able to to look for and understand this complex world without imposing our own biases on it. 
And it's not just the kinds of molecules, it's how they interact and hang together. So for us, for biochemistry, most molecules tend to sort of have interchanges by breaking and making covalent bonds. That's sort of the language that our, our you know, ATP, how we, how we collect energy and use energy in our cells, um, how we do basic biochemistry. But on Titan, that bond is, the temperatures are so low that typical chemistry can slow down or stop completely. So some of those molecules, they're, they're really hard to, to break. That nut is really tough to crack. Instead, weaker bonds, things like hydrogen bonds, van der Waals, forces, things like that, may take the place of covalent bonds in a, a type of biosphere on Titan. So these are the kinds of things that we try to think about and replicate in the lab. And so a lot of times I'll take liquid nitrogen, which is just a little bit cooler than Titan surface. Titan surface, anyone know how cold it is? Anybody, anyone? 90 Kelvin, it's minus 183 degrees C. Don't ask me what it is in Fahrenheit. I'm a scientist, I don't work in Fahrenheit. It's really cold, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, so liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin, so we heat it up to 90, and we'll use things like this cryo stage to be able to replicate those conditions in the lab. And then we can use you know, microscopes like you see here, Raman spectrometers, things to be able to study those kinds of materials, and we found all sorts of wild and crazy things. We basically found the equivalent of minerals, like rocks, you know, like halite and silica and stuff like that, except they're made out of organic molecules, some of which can kill you. Um, let's see, benzene, benzene can kill you. Ammonia smells terrible. Acetylene blows up uh, if you look at it wrong. Butane burns. So these are things that, you know, for us, they could be hazardous or dangerous, but on Titan, they're just chilling. They're hanging out on the surface and they're making new minerals with different properties than some of the pure compounds. And so we figured out, we've discovered, we and others uh, have discovered quite a few now, and the list increases. In fact, uh, where's Natalie? Raise your hand. Where is she? There, my student this summer has discovered a couple more. <laughs> They're not on this graphic yet. I didn't have time to stick them on. Um, but the point is, it's a really fascinating world. I'm so excited that we're gonna get to explore it with Dragonfly. Uh, please write your congressman, call your congressman, make sure they know that this stuff is important, that we care. And of course, I couldn't do any of this alone. These are massive teams uh, with funding. We collaborate with people all over the world. Thank you all so much for your time and attention, and I am happy to answer, hopefully answer any of the questions you might have.